Well, church family, I pray you're ready for an anointed word today. We are in a series entitled Greater Love. It's a word that really God birthed in my heart, in my life, that if we really want to see transformation in our day, there's so much call for transformation, for change to happen in dramatic ways in our world because of the tensions, the pain that so many are feeling, the grief that many are walking through during this time, the angst and frustration that's erupting. But I believe the greatest answer is found in the transformation that comes from the love of God changing our lives. So we need a greater love, church. We need to experience. We need to exude. We need to live in that place of that greater love. Last week, we kicked off the series, and I'm excited for part two today. And I'm not going to be bringing that word, but instead a friend, um, a fellow uh, worker in the gospel, an anointed preacher of God's word, Pastor Jermel Mayo. He is an evangelist. He serves with uh, Regenerate Ministries, uh, something he launched some years ago. He has been a pastor here in uh, Newark, New Jersey for many years, and God has just worked so dramatically in his life and transformed and changed him. And this word today is fire. So get ready, share it with someone, uh, tell them. I saw so many people at 9 a.m. saying, I got to listen to this again. I got to share it with someone. So you have a chance right now up front. Click share, tell someone, because lives are going to be changed today from the preaching of God's word. Amen. So come on, would you welcome uh, Pastor Jamel with me today, church family, as he comes to bring God's word. So good to be in God's house. Come on and give the Lord some praise. He's so worthy. I'm really excited to be here at Scott's Plains for many reasons. Number one, I love putting in my GPS. I already know where it's at. So I just put on the GPS so that I can know uh, how fast I'm going. But other than that, I know the address. This is a wonderful, wonderful church, wonderful pastor. And uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm getting all giddy because I'm sitting in a church or standing in a church with like people here. This is like great. The presence of God, like there are angels flying around. I'm giving them high fives. And I hope that you're sensing that over your screen. But man, the presence of God, worship team, all the production people, the camera guys, the sound booth people. Man, kudos. You guys are working so hard so the message of Jesus Christ can touch our city and around the world. So I want to just say thank you. You know, during this time, obviously we're living in, uh, uh, I don't believe that this caught God by, by, by uh, sort of surprise. And uh, when this happened on March 15th, I'm never going to forget this. I, I didn't understand this, this virus or whatever. And I remember going into a service about to preach and there was some murmuring going on. And the following weekend, the March, March 15th, the 23rd, the Lord's called my wife and I to preach the gospel in places where he's just opened up doors for us. But can I be honest? When I first got this message, I said, Lord, what, what, what do you want us to do? What is the word of God speaking to our hearts and lives? We've never been this way before. And I just felt the Lord in my heart say, I want you to do what I've called you to do. And I'm still going to open up greater doors for you so that the message of Jesus Christ can go even further. I remember getting a call from our dear loving friends in India. And this was the first time I traveled to India virtually for free. Come on, somebody. I'm used to being on a plane for 14 hours. I love it. But man, I got a chance to virtually, from the comfort of my home, share the gospel. And I watched God touch young people all over Calcutta. And 20 million people that live in that city believing that the gospel is touching their hearts and lives. And so I believe that this time, God is just springboarding us so that the gospel message can go forth in power and in might. So I got to be honest. I love your church. I love your pastor. I love what God is doing here at Evangel. And uh, seeing from a distance what God is doing, the church has never been closed. It's open like never before. And the message of Christ is going forward. So we thank God for that. Thank you, Pastor, for having me come. I want to share a message in your Greater Love series entitled The God of Transformation. We're going to look at a book in the Bible that you read all the time. I mean, it's one of your favorite books of all in the Bible. It's Philemon. Yes, I said Philemon. Right there in your New Testament, don't go to the Old Testament. Flip over to the right. There towards the end. 
the Apostle Paul writes a letter to Philemon, who was a slave owner, and he's writing on behalf of a young man by the name of Onesimus, who was a runaway slave. I'm so thankful that we serve a God that is present even in times like this. Right. That the scriptures does not duck problems and crisis, but the word of God speaks clearly even today. So let's look at this message entitled, The God of Transformation. We're picking up in the, in the, in the book of Philemon here, chapter 1, verse number 8. And it reads this way on this beautiful Sunday morning. It says, therefore, although in Christ, Paul is writing to him. Although in Christ I can be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Let's pause it right there for just a moment. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't like taking orders. When my mom and daddy tells me what to do, sometimes I don't know about you. Don't know if that's your testimony. But sometimes just because you told me what to do, I'm not going to do it. Because there's a rebellion spirit in our, inside of all of us. But I want you to see. Paul did not lean on just his authority. Paul leaned on the power of a greater love that can transform a heart. He says, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man now, also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Pinnat, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping with me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced but voluntary. Perhaps the reason why he was separated for you from a little while was that you might have him back forever. I love this. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother in Christ. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, I think the Apostle Paul was reading from the Good Samaritan. He said, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll pay it back. Oh, by the way, not to mention you owe me your very self. I want to pause here. Maybe I didn't say this. This is why I like two services. I want to pause here by saying this. The moment you experience God's love and forgiveness, you have no right to withhold love and forgiveness from somebody else. I want to look at this. Paul said... I'm writing this with my own hand. I don't wish, brother, that I might have some benefit from you in the Lord. So he says, refresh my heart in Christ. I'm confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Father, in Jesus' name, let the preaching of your word touch every heart and every home. Father, we need the love of God to fill our hearts. Let us overflow with the spirit of almighty God. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, you're watching, come on, amen. amen and amen. You say, who was Onesimus? Latinized form of his name, a Greek name, Onesimus, which means beneficial, profitable. St. Onesimus was an escaped slave of Philemon who met St. Paul while he was in prison and possibly obviously converted by him. Paul sent them back to Philemon carrying the very epistle we're reading today. Again, his name Onesimus, which, you, which means useful, beneficial, and profitable. I don't know about you, but outside of Christ, maybe you say, man, I'm very profitable. I'm getting things done. Profit for the world, you'll lose and forfeit your soul. I'm so thankful that in the gospel, we see a God that transforms hearts and lives. In other words... The transformation will be so powerful. When God's love fills your heart, people will not recognize the person that you used to be. You see, that's what makes Christianity so much different than any other religion of the world. Hear me, here's why. Because as you follow Christ, he transforms you in a process. I call it the God 
of transformation. How many of you know that you were not where you may not be where you used to be, but I'm thankful. Listen to me. I might not be where I want to be, but I'm thankful I'm not where I used to be. That always in Christ we're moving forward in Jesus' name. Look at your neighbor and say, he's the God of transformation. Come on, if you're drinking coffee right now, I want you to say, he's the God of transformation. In other words, when Christ gets a hold of you, he has the power and the authority to change you from the inside out. I was reading from the book of Corinthians. Uh, writers say or theologians say that there were actually four books that Paul wrote or four letters that he wrote to the Corinthian church. I, I wonder why he had to write four times to them. Has your mama or your daddy ever tried to get you and say things four times? Kind of means that there's a problem. There's a problem in the Corinthian church. They were doing things that made the world go, I can't believe they're doing that. The Bible says this. Here's what division looks like. Here's what a church by just name but not action looks like. It says, Paul said, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? He says, he says, but watch this. He goes, instead, you yourselves cheat and you do wrong. He goes on to say, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Can I be honest with you? I pray that there's a move of the Spirit that causes us to do things greater than ourselves. And it will be the love of God working through us. And I'm praying in Jesus' name that the church of Jesus Christ would arise and say, this is what love looks like. Paul goes on to say, there's neither no sexual immorality, no adulterers, no men having sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the slenders, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And I love what Paul says. Paul will never point you to your past without glorifying Jesus for your future. He says it in verse 11, and that is what some of you not are, that is what you were. But now you have been washed, you've been sanctified, you have been justified. That terminology justified, come on somebody, we got to preach. That justification, justification can only come from a higher power. Meaning when you walk into a courtroom, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever walked in there, but I had to go to a courtroom before um, because I had a speeding ticket. Sometimes my foot liked to hit the pedal a little too hard. Come on, somebody. And I kind of got to get before the judge or whatever. You got to get before the judge. And before you get to the judge, you got to tuck your shirt in because you got to stand before the judge. So I'm ready to go before the judge, you know. And then before I get to the judge, they go, hey, oh, oh, oh. you got to go to the prosecutor. So I'm just trying to, I'm just giving you my testimony. You got to go to the prosecutor. And usually the prosecutor is off in a corner somewhere. He's making deals. He's making deals. He's making deals. He knows my name, my address, my telephone number. And he doesn't never met me a day in his life, but he knows exactly what I did. I go over to the prosecutor. The prosecutor goes, hey, 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 hey. You're guilty. Well, you don't even know me. He goes, you're guilty. Hey, if you confess that you're guilty, I'll take it down from a four-pointer to a two-pointer. You know what I said? I said, well, therefore, I'm guilty. I go to the, after I go to the prosecutor, I say no word to the judge. The judge already has the written charge against us. I don't know about you, but I see that prosecutor like the enemy himself. Satan comes and he accuses us before the Father day and night. But aren't you thankful that we have a righteous judge that says regardless of what he's done, my blood is able to cover him and wash him and give him life. I'm so thankful that I'm justified in Jesus, that when God sees me, he don't see my mess. He sees the blood of Jesus all over me, and so does he see it with you. Paul then goes on to say, therefore, I want you to flee from the things that were holding you back. All other sins commits outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body, then I love what Paul does. Here's how Paul reasons with us. He goes, do you not know? This is a rhetorical question. Do you not know that you are the temple? Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit where Christ 
dwells. When people see you, do they see Jesus? Paul said, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Onesimus, you used to be a runaway slave. Maybe you weren't operating according to the purposes and plans that God had for you. His name was given to him before the foundations of the earth. But now we're going to watch how God, Christ, transforms his life. I'm so thankful for the word of Jeremiah. I believe that this is the word that the world needs to hear in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. God says, before I formed you in a womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Do you understand what love does? Love is able to see through mess and see potential. That's what Christ does for us. And he appoints us to work his ministry. Onesimus, even while you were in your mess and away from the plans of God, God used even prison to get a hold of your life. Man may reject you. They may talk about you. They may walk on you. They may disrespect you. But I'm just thankful that heaven knows my name. I'm thankful that the love of God touches my heart and my life. He loves you and has a plan for your life. Listen, maybe you're watching. I want you to know that you are loved by God. And God has a beautiful plan for you. Transformation begins when you let God in. In Philemon chapter 1 verse 10 through 11, I love what Paul says. The Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while in chains. Verse 11, formerly he was useless, but now he has become. I don't know your story. I know my story. Before Christ, I was useless. I knew my name. My mama named me. I knew what I liked to do, play basketball. But in my heart of hearts, I was lost. I was destined to the grave, a relationship not with God, but with the world. And I'm so thankful that the God that transforms me says, I want to take you from useless and make you productive. Everyone in Christ has a formerly. Don't care if you grew up in church. That doesn't even make sense. It's impossible for you to grow up in the building, but maybe you grew up around great families and great moms and dads that showed you the way, praise God, but you still have a formerly. In the book of Galatians chapter 1, I'm so thankful that the Apostle Paul, who wrote 12 to 13 books of the Bible, did not hide his past. I think what the world needs to see today is this, I was a man that was once lost, but now I'm found. I'm not afraid of you to see my pain because I've been healed. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I, the gospel I preached had no origin in the will of man. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation of Christ himself. For you heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age and among my people, and I was extremely zealous for the traditions of the Father. Hear me today. I want to make this broad announcement overline here that we can look at the Apostle Paul and we can judge what he's doing while, while forgetting what is in his heart. See, God is after the heart because if he can get the heart, he can get the behavior. He goes, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see the super apostles. No, I went to Arabia. I had the process for about a year and a half. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God can take my filthy past, come on, and still use it for his glory. I want everyone to listen. There's still hope in your mess. God takes me from my mess. He separates me from my mess, but then uses my mess to pull others from their mess. Why does he do that? Because I can identify. Watch. If you have the love of God living in your heart, it is not there so that you can look over people. It's there so that you can reach out to people. He takes us from useless to useful, from less to full, 
from less to more than enough, from lost to found, from death to life, from hell to heaven, from poor to rich, from sinner to saint. He's the God that transforms our lives. You say, how does this happen? That's a great question. How many know it doesn't happen overnight? How many of you know that you are and I am, my wife reminds me of it every day, I am a work in progress. This body is under construction by the Holy Spirit. And my wife is watching, she's saying amen at that time. Hold your amens at that moment. Come on now. But first, in order for transformation to happen, God has to attack the whose you are called your identity. Whether, whatever you are, wherever you are, however you've come to Christ, the first step to salvation is he has to, he has to capture the one who's captivated you. Yeah. He's got to deal with the person, the spirit person who's robbing you from the life that God has for you. This is why Jesus had to go to the cross. This is why he rose from the dead. Because in doing that, he took away all the written charges that were against you. He ripped you from Satan's clutches on, by his amazing love that he had poured in our lives. Philemon chapter 1 verse 10, he says that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. You know, oftentimes I think we're reading the Bible way too fast. That when, I, when I looked at this verse 10, can I, can I be honest? I had a wild moment. I've, I love the Apostle Paul, read all his books, obviously, on his life, but nowhere in the Apostle Paul's life did I read he had children. Paul, in the, in the book of Corinthians, I believe he, he talked about it's better, uh, you know, kind of not to marry. I was like, wow, I got a problem with that, Paul. I love my wife. Whatever. Paul dealt with all these issues. Nowhere in the scriptures... Paul actually said, I'd rather you not. That way you could be devoted unto the Lord. So I don't see where Paul can have a son because he wasn't married. I, I want you to see this. Paul speaks to his identity. And he says this. Listen, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I don't know about you, but when your heavenly father says to you, you're my child. You're my son. You're my daughter. I don't know about you. Someone might have walked out on your life. Someone might have disappointed you. But there's no love greater than our father's love. When I was five years old, my biological, my biological father walked out of the house on us. I remember, I am 41 years old, and I still remember the night he walked out. I remember me crying. I remember my mom in tears. I remember words flying. I remember, I remember, I remember. I, I just remember the hurt, the pain, the agony. We're living in Brooklyn, New York, Farragut Projects. We're growing up there. And I believe what's plaguing America today in our world, and we got to look at this, is an absentee father. It's hurting us. And I remember growing up in those things, and I, I remember... Before I came to Christ at 19, I had a major issue with a heavenly father when the man that I can see walked out on me. This is a huge verse for me because here's what Paul is doing. Paul is taking the role of a spiritual father and he's covering him. He's covering him. He's saying, Onesimus, when you walk to me, you came in one way, but through my relationship with you, you're going to leave a different way. You're my son. Onesimus, you belong to somebody. You have purpose. You have an identity. When God can change the whose you are, he can then look at the who's, who you are. I call it the character. I call it the places that nobody else sees. That God loves you in the intimate most places. God changes who you are. Bible says in Philemon chapter 1 verse 11, Formerly he was useless to you, 
But now he has become useful both to you and to me. What our world needs is not another religion, but they need a demonstration of Christ's power. What our world needs, listen to me, Christianity was never meant to be behavior modification, but a process of transformation. It's the moment when Jesus steps in and he begins to transform us from the inside out. When I was 19 years old, I asked Jesus to come in. Let me, I got some good news. I was a lost 19-year-old boy. But when Christ came in, I got saved. I immediately shared the gospel with my brother. He got saved. I shared it with my mom. She got saved. I shared it with my stepdad. He got saved. I shared it even with my mother-in-law. And guess what happened? She got saved. I'm talking. I was first-generation Christian. I do not believe that God intended for the gospel to end with you. It's a great love that the world needs to hear. He changes our character. Thirdly, when he changes our character, he wants to get a hold of our vision. Our vision. God changes how you see. Isn't that what our world needs now? We need some different lenses, man. We need to see different. We need to think different. We need to operate different. It all happens when we let God in. In Philemon chapter 1, verse 15 through 16, the Bible says, he says, perhaps the reason why he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Paul had different sets of eyes. When I read this here, he didn't say so that you can have him back as long as he lives. Paul was speaking of an eternal bond. He uses the word perhaps. Let me bring this down to 2020. You ever lose something? Maybe something that was valuable to you? Maybe keys, kids, uh, wallet. Things that has value, and you lose it. And you go to your friend and go, hey, friend, hey, listen up real quick. Hey, I lost, I, I lost something. Um, and they go like this. Here, here's what we do. I'm going to pray for you. They're not praying for you. You know why? Because they didn't lose it. Right. The person that feels it the most is the one that lost something. Philemon lost something. But through it all, God was telling him, listen, this Onesimus does not belong to you. You you don't own him. He belongs to God, not you. So Paul goes, perhaps. I think we need people in our lives that see differently. I can walk into a room and people see problems. I see promise. We sing songs all the time. God, God, you know, God, whatever the devil meant for evil, you're turning it for good. We love to sing it, but are we living it? I believe that with all of my heart that the things that have happened in my past, God can use to bring me to what he has for me. I stopped blaming God a long time ago for where I was brought up. I stopped blaming God a long time ago of the color of my skin. I stopped blaming God a long time ago of all the experiences he's given me, even the ones that hurt the most. Here's why. Because I'm able to sympathize with those weaknesses in others. I'm able to take young boys close to me and say, I know what it means to have a father walk out on you, but that does not need to be what, 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 what God is doing now. God has a greater purpose for your life. And what I love about Paul, Paul always said this, listen, follow me as I follow Christ. So Paul had a perhaps in his spirit. He saw things differently. That's what transformation does. Fourthly, the God of transformation changes what we become. I love Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works. I love this. 
which God has already prepared in advance for us to do. Evangel Church, God has a game plan for your church. He's already gone before you. Will you tune into the voice and simply follow Jesus? When you follow him, guess what he's wanting you to do? He's wanting you to bring the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry that has the power of love. I remember before I got saved, I was so angry. I was so mad. I was bound by sin and the things of this world. And I just remember, listen, I'm being honest. I didn't change myself. It's impossible. The power is too strong. I needed something greater. Do you know what God used to deliver me from sin? It wasn't just a smack over my head with the Bible. It was his amazing love. His amazing love set me free. I felt a greater love than the things of this world. I'm not going back. I can't go back because can't nobody do me like Jesus. There's no greater love. There's no greater love. And it's my prayer that when people walk by, they'll smell Jesus. There's something different about this man and woman. Lastly, if the team can begin to come, your purpose lines you up with eternity. Eternity. God changes where I go. In John 14, verse 1, Jesus says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Listen, if we have a problem with people down here, you'll have a problem with people up there because there's going to be a group of people from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation, and we're all in one voice going to say hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Worthy is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the earth. Can I be real with you today? At that moment, we're not going to be wondering who's white or who's black. At that time, I'm not going to be wondering where you came from. At that time, I'm not going to be wondering where you ate. At that time, we're going to be on our knees before God. And with my brothers, black, white, yellow, Indian, hate, whatever it is, and with one voice, we're going to lift up our voice to heaven and say, you deserve all the glory. You deserve all the honor. And the presence of God is going to fill that place and it's going to unify a people again. And the church of Jesus Christ is going to rise again. And we're going to look to the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the earth. In my house are many rooms. Let me bore you a little bit with this. In a Jewish home, in a Jewish home, a father, a father, a father helps his son to build a place. So when they go off and get married, it's a lot different than America. They're kind of scouting out. You know, they're making, okay, we're going to put you over here with that one. God's going to do it. And so what happens is at that moment they set their eyes on one another. The son cannot bring his bride home until the house is ready. So he goes, and it's usually off his father's house. It's usually off his father's house. And the father is monitoring whether or not the house is done yet. And so the son, come on somebody, when the son is ready to bring a bride home, he works extra hard. Come on somebody. 
He, so he's working day in, day out. He's working, he's working. He's putting nails in place and smacking on the mud. And he's working day and night. And he's going, Dad, is the house ready yet? Is the house ready yet? And the dad says, son, the house isn't ready yet. And he goes back hard at labor. Dad, come on, I got to bring my bride home. He's working on the house. He's working on the house. He's got a good spirit because he knows pretty soon I got to go get my bride. And he's working. He's working. He's working the house. And then he looks to the father. And he says, Dad, is the house ready yet? And the dad, father goes, son, go get your bride. Wait, it gets better. So they go through the town. And they're knocking. And they go. And the bride is waiting in her home. Because she knows. Maybe it's been a year. Because you know when men say they're going to do something. Anyway. And it's been a while. And the bride is waiting. All these brides are waiting. To their husband come running. And they're going through the town. And I can imagine when a bride gets a knock at the door. And everyone's wondering in the town, could that be my man? What's going to happen when Jesus comes looking for his bride? And he steps in the doorway of his bride. And the bride opens up the door and what he finds is another man living there. And in her eyes fill up with disappointment. I didn't know that you were coming yet. I think what the world needs to hear my Savior is on the way. My house is pure. My house has been washed clean. My house has the blood of Jesus on his doorpost. In my house, there is no racism. In my house, there's no division. In my house, we honor God. In my house, we lift up the Christ. So when Jesus comes back and gets me, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Maybe you're watching. And your house is not in order. The reason why Jesus hasn't come yet, he's waiting for your house to get in order. So how do I do this? You let God in. Bring him into the closet that you don't want nobody else to know about. Bring them into your yard space. Bring them into your bedroom. Bring them into your living room. Bring them into every nook and cranny of your home. Because I serve a God that will never judge you. He loves you. My prayer for this world is this. Let's stop judging things that we are not willing to train. Jesus says, he stands at the door of your heart. Will you let him in? If you're watching... Now's the day for your salvation. Lift up your hands and allow the Savior to come in. You're watching and you never made a commitment to Christ? I'm not just talking to you. Maybe you're watching and you let another thing come into your heart that is not of God. Come on, we got to cast that thing out in Jesus' name and allow the love of God to captivate your heart all over again. So whether that's you or whether this is your first time, I want you to say this with me. Come on. Come on. Lift up your voice. Don't worry about being awkward. What's awkward is you missing this moment. What's awkward is spending eternity in hell. That's awkward. We serve a God that said, for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son, that whomever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the message of the greater love. So say this with me, dear Jesus. I'm asking you right now, come into my heart, come into my life. Lord, I believe you died on the cross 
And you rose in three days. So God, change me. Make me brand new. Lord, let your love fill my heart. Lord, change my anger. Give me a deep joy and a deeper peace that can't come from nobody else but you. Change me. In Jesus' name. Come on, you're watching. Say it with me. Amen. And amen. If you're watching and you just gave your life to Christ or rededicated your walk with God, listen, I want you to do something crazy today. I want you to write it down in a comment and say, yes, that's me. Come on, write it down in a comment. Why you say this? God says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. My Jesus died on a hill called Calvary. He died with his arms stretched open wide so that there'll be no shadow of a doubt that he loves you. And I want you to write in there, man, I give my life to Christ. I rededicated my life to Christ. And I know that this wonderful church and ministry is going to follow up with you. Come up here, Pastor Chris, just for a moment. Come on, send those emojis if you love your pastor. Send them little emojis. I love them. I love them. Hands waved up. Come on, wave towels, whatever you got to do. Wave it, wave it, wave it. Come on, come on, just wave that towel. I love your pastor. Come here, Pastor Chris. What our world needs to see, besides this social distancing, is that we're linked in heart. We have a kindred spirit. There's unity here. Chris called me and said, hey, I need you to come and, and bring the message. Why? Because it's the same gospel. If we can get a hold of what God's doing in the kingdom, we'll be better for it. And I'm believing God for you, Pastor Chris, your family, your children, praying God's blessing, God's favor over your life, praying that God will give you an unusual anointing and wisdom during this season. You don't know where you're going until the master leads you. So keep being led by the good shepherd. The shepherd is what leads his sheep. The shepherd guides his sheep. The shepherd takes care of his sheep. Whatever God has placed in your heart, Pray that it come to pass that you'll fall in love with Jesus. God bless you, man. Love you, man. Thank you. Love you, buddy. Amen. Love you, man. Oh, come on, church family. Can you feel that at home? The presence of God just meeting us at this time in this place. God is so good. He's so faithful. Man, I love you, Pastor Jamel. Thank you for bringing that word. Hit, hit my heart. I know this is the greater love God is talking about, wants us to experience. And for those of you that today was the day you made that decision to follow Jesus, this is the greatest decision you've ever made. Maybe today's the day your house is getting in order. If that's you, we want to walk with you. Nobody walks alone here at Evangel. We want to be there step in step with you. We have a book called Following Jesus. It's our gift to you today. All you need to do is let us know you made that decision. So if you commented, as Pastor Jamel said, then we're going to get this to you. We'll connect with you. But another way you can do that is text us the word Jesus to 908 325 5163. Just text that. Or you can click on the link there in the chat, fill out a form, let us know. We'll send this to you digitally. We love you, church family. Come on, right now, let me pray for you. We're going to go back into a song of worship. Just call upon God's presence to meet us at this time. Just call upon him, invite him right now to seal this word in your heart. Lord, we thank you and we love you, Lord God. We give you this day, this day that you've made. We give you this word, Lord God. We ask you right now, Holy Spirit, come and speak to our hearts. Show us, Lord God, where you want to open our eyes, where you want to show us new things, where you want to change who we are. You want to transform our identity, our character, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that this love roots us and transforms us into who you want us to be. We thank you, Lord, and we live in that place today in your name. Amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord as we close out our service together. Let's continue to call upon his name. Amen.